I was born into the American dream. My father came to the United States with nothing and worked hard to provide us with a better life. But for too many poor kids, this isn't America anymore. Today, more than 50 million Americans live in distressed communities with high rates of unemployment, addiction, crime, and violence. I spent five years exploring this lost American interior. I thought I'd be telling an economic story, but over time I discovered there's a deeper human crisis. We're coming apart economically to be sure, but we're also coming apart as a culture. This is the story of three forgotten American cities. It's a look at this new American poverty through the eyes of the people living it. It's an attempt to find out if there's any hope left. In memory of my son, Tony Jonathan Mendoza. In memory of my brother, Dennis James Martin Jr. I love you, baby. In loving memory of my granddaughter, Mahalo. I miss you, baby. Some new numbers from the U.S. Census Bureau don't paint a very positive picture of Youngstown. We're one of six cities in the country with a poverty rate more than 40 percent. Basically, Youngstown was the center of this area for years, and then after the steel mills fell, it just all crumbled. I'm third generation. I've worked at steel mill for a year and a half. And now the steel mill ain't even there. In my lifetime, I've seen nothing really get any better. I guess they got like 8,000 houses that, that are empty in Youngstown, so, you know what I mean? They're probably all basically on the condemn list, you know, to be torn down. This block here is pretty much on its way out. It just keeps going down one at a time. Scraps down right now, it's harder and harder to find anything that's got real good value because it's been picked out over the years. Got the furnace motor off the top of it, you get maybe 25 cents a pound for that. You got most of the wires all cut out of this one. You just got the cable wires hanging down. And I think in the past you had a lot of really, really proud people who lived here you know, believed in what they did. They believed in their friends and neighbors and family. Well, now I don't believe any of that exists anymore. You know, fight or flight, a lot of people flighted out of here. The most important thing in this world would be survival, just getting through into the next day just be happy you, you were able to survive and you made it here. We're right here in Youngstown, right here on the map. <laughs> We 
got our big paycheck. We got $42 out of that load of just pieces and parts. They can see what the prices are. We'll just go from there. I don't know, me, it's turning into a third world country here. You're losing too many people in between. Their dreams ain't coming true and they're getting cast away. It's gonna be up to the individual just who's ever gonna hold their ground just to make their own space better. Youngstown was once a great American city. 50 years ago, there were 25 miles of steel mills up and down the Mahoning River. Men like Todd left high school, found work in the factories, and moved their families into the middle class. But then came the reckoning. It took 150 years to make Youngstown rich, but less than a generation for it to fall. Today, Youngstown is the poorest city in America. It's lost 40,000 manufacturing jobs and more than half of its total population. The reality is that cities like Youngstown failed to make the transition from the modern to the postmodern world. On the surface, they've lost the factories, but deeper than this, they've lost the human bonds that once held people together. For most of the people here, it feels like there's a vortex beneath the city. Over the past 30 years, there's been a dramatic rise in depression, addiction, violence, and suicide. So many people die each day from opioid overdoses, the county coroner can't handle all the bodies. But it's at night when this spirit of destruction comes out in full force. Every year, vandals set fire to more than 200 abandoned homes across the city. The fire department lets them burn to the ground. We've demolished the old social order, but found nothing to replace it. It used to be a long time ago that the west side was still the better side and then pretty much now though there's really not I'd say a very good side of town some are worse than others my generation is the generation to come after the big fall there was a house there that's gone now us kids that grew up in the late 80s and early 90s we're trying to make our way with our families and starting off but there's just not a lot to offer anymore. Seems like poverty is kind of like a really mean disease that just kind of slowly creeps and consumes and it's just spreading. And then this is my old house here. It's all boarded up. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, this is, this is where I grew up. This is the first house my dad ever bought. But this is obviously the kitchen, which there used to be a little small kitchen table here. I remember many a days my mom and my aunt sitting there. There was a lot of violence in my home growing up. My dad inherited my grandfather's alcoholic gene, I guess you could say, and he drank a lot. And when he would come home, my mom was his punching bag. My dad did work very hard, but he had a second job that we were unaware of, which was he was a drug dealer. And ultimately, that's what took his life. He was murdered. So I often wonder what life would be like if my dad were alive. 
Would my mom and dad have stayed together? Would he have stopped hurting her? Would he have gotten help for his own personal demons and addictions? Wow. So sad. This is one of my favorite pictures of you. Aww. Here's Dad with some bunny ears. When I first found out I was pregnant, I was 15. And doing it on my own as a single parent and making ends meet and trying to provide the best that I possibly could, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. And my goal has always been to let Nikki learn from my own experiences and to maybe understand how things can work out when you really don't train yourself on reaching that finish line. The end for Youngstown, I think, is probably just going to be everything's going to be boarded up. It's going to be a little dead town that used to be something. It's going to be a ghost town. Why are you having all these children with the extra money? And no one really seems happy here. People go to bars and drink and try to, like, numb their pain of being here. In a way, I have a sense of pride for the place, but I also, I'm very embarrassed of where I live. To say that I come from Youngstown, Ohio, it gives you that pit at the bottom of your stomach, like, oh, it really isn't a great place. In places like Youngstown, people find themselves caught between two worlds, the vanishing, stable way of life and a new, uncertain future that's spread through the American interior. Throughout your history, Youngstown and the Mahoning Valley have been at the heart of this nation and its life. For decades, presidential candidates from both political parties have made the pilgrimage to Youngstown, promising to revive the middle-class industrial economy. One million square foot mill right here in Youngstown. But nothing has stopped the city's decline. Since the fall of the steel mills, the public bureaucracy has taken over as the dominant social and economic institution in Youngstown. The top 10% of the population works in the public bureaucracy and runs a vast network of social programs, while the bottom 50% survives on public assistance, disability, or is currently incarcerated. In the 44509 zip code on Youngstown's west side, 41% of all working age men are unemployed or out of the labor force, and 69% of all families are headed by a single mother. People find themselves trapped in a web of social programs, part-time work, and the black market economy. The experts are still trying to figure out what happened. In 1983, we were touring around getting pictures, vantage points of the mill. And this is the exact spot where we stood to take this photograph of the Camel Works. This is a radically changed scene from what we first saw. But this is where it all began for the decline of Youngstown, the beginning of the end when they shut this down. Youngstown is one of many of the forgotten cities in America. Life for the American worker has forever changed. Those high paying jobs are fewer and fewer. More and more things are getting automated. What do people do? That's the question that's universal to all of these places. 
everybody's holding on to what they got, you know? Because there ain't no money to make so here, it's man. So tight, it's tight here? Yeah. yeah. So did you benefit from when, when the money was good? You yeah, guys paid yeah, their bills on time. Yeah, yeah, me and my wife have been good now. Nothing now, you know what I mean? Nothing coming in. You know what I mean? I live on Social Security. Me and her got Social Security. That's the only way I make it. Otherwise, it. me and my wife the same way. What about jobs though? It's like the mills and stuff. Any else? No, kind not, of... You ain't never gonna see yeah. nothing like that. They're, they're a matter of fact, they're laying off. Yeah, over there. Just, just yeah. laid off they're laying off a shitload of people, man. So, Youngstown has been shrinking, shrinking. You think it's going to shrink a lot more? Yeah. We've had a great displacement in our culture through this deindustrialization, through this transformation. But displacement does not mean a permanent situation. Displacement means you're hunting, you're searching for something. We're trying to deal with this great displacement and find this new whatever it's going to be. Well, look at this. There's your employee pass. Wow. You had to check a box if you wanted to go to the hospital, department, general office, or leave plant. It had to be signed by your boss. So this is this piece of paperwork where... One of journalism's great promises is to show you cause and effect. Why did this happen? And so at some point you say, well, if you do this, you get this. Just as in the 50s, Life magazine showed these great prosperous, the steel mill belching and the man picking up his new car and the woman with her new Frigidaire. Well, the modern equivalent of that essay is this closes, now there's a line for free government cheese, now there's people with empty refrigerators, kids who aren't learning in school. The prosperity start with this place when it was booming and the downhill slide began when they closed. Walking through ruins like this, I think about all the lives that were lived here. And every time I get emotional, every time uh, I think about the people who didn't make it. Some people committed suicide. Some people ended up mentally ill. If I were here alone, I'd probably spend the rest of the evening walking through these ruins just thinking about them. In many ways, Youngstown is a symbol of what's to come. We've had economic changes before, but this is the first time our social institutions have collapsed as well. At heart, the crisis in America's forgotten cities is a crisis of meaning. All of the old structures that once provided a solid foundation, faith, family, work, and community, have slowly fallen apart. The real problem is not just economic, but deeply personal, human, even spiritual. But what's most remarkable about the people in Youngstown is that despite all of the disorder that surrounds them, they still have the will to live. Their basic human aspirations have not died out. Everything I've, that I use, I find in the house cleanouts I do. So you don't really have any money and materials, so you're able to go with an idea and see what it does. Todd has struggled with addiction, been arrested a dozen times, and walked out on his wife and daughter. But he still wants to make sense of the world and find meaning in the chaos. But this one here, you know, when you go into the houses, you find like old flags and different stuff, but I call this one old and gray. And I put the American flag in there because it's like turning old. You know, it's like there's no, no life to it where it seems to be like, what people think about America now is worse than ever. Jennifer has made ends meet as a bartender, collecting public assistance and selling pints of blood. But she desperately wants to provide a better life for her daughter. She knows that most poor kids who don't get out of this neighborhood will remain poor for the rest of their lives. There's just empty houses everywhere. And then 
people do move in and then they destroy the houses and then they just leave them. For young people like Nikki, the choice is heart-wrenching. Stay to be near friends, family, and the last vestiges of community, or pack up and leave Youngstown forever. It's a human question with no easy answer. It's better in the dark because you can see the light on the cone so you know when you're past it. It's just scary. Nikki's all I've known most of my life. This whole past year has been a lot of moments like that between learning how to drive, getting a job, starting her own savings, talking about college makes it all real. Watching yeah. Nikki grow up and coming into these final years before she becomes an adult and she's out on her own, it's a catch-22. I'm so proud of her, but it does make me sad. Pretty much living in Youngstown, when you get out of high school and you go to college, chances are you're going to leave the area. You have to go where you can survive. Bam! What is your problem? <laughs> Cause me to get in a wreck. Stand. For me, graduating and going to college has always been my biggest goal. And now that it's here, it's kind of scary of what's supposed to happen next. Tatum Isabel Flesh. Nicolette Elizabeth French. If I stayed here, I'm scared that I'm going to have a crappy job that I don't like. I'm scared that I'm going to live the same life that everyone else does. We love you, we miss you, and we all your hopes and dreams be fulfilled. I'm very proud. Something I don't have. I'm very proud of her. She did a great job. She earned it. She's a hard worker. She's a great kid. I don't want to leave my family, but there's nothing here. There's no opportunities for me here. I don't want to leave my mom. She's my best friend, and she doesn't want to leave here. The violence seems never ending. So far this year, more than 60 people have been killed in Memphis. Right now, the city is on track to record 240 homicides, breaking a record for the most murders in Memphis in one year. Well, Merle, you know, they say that life is what you make it. And back in 1941, this place, Foot Homes, was a place that people came with their dreams and opportunities rising up from the Delta, migrating here, thinking that this was going to be a, a golden place to live. Well, it's been decades since that happened. Maybe it's time now, and a lot of people told me this today, it's time to move on. And there's a lot of that feeling of desperation, especially around the Foot Homes area and in, and in other places. Memphis is a town now of about 650,000 people. It used to be a kind of an economic jewel for black people here. That was in the days when there were companies like Firestone, and International Harvester. But when those 
places and plants and companies left. It basically left Memphis without a middle class. And this is a, an area that really people are just hanging on. At one time, fairly decent, but it grew violent pretty quickly. Is it kind of scary? At night. At night? How long have you lived here? 20 years. 20 years. What was it like 20 years ago? Had how, I mean, people lived here and all? Yes, it was, somebody lived in both of them, and the man who lived here, he died. So, and then some junkies burned his house down, so they tore his house down, but, these have been abandoned for like six years. Six years. Wow. Do you ever, do you fear for their safety? Yeah. And I had a big dog, but somebody killed him. Somebody poisoned him. How do you protect yourself? Well, I mostly rely on faith. I feel like if I'm a good person, God ain't gonna let nothing happen that wasn't supposed to happen. And if it happened, it was time or it was supposed to happen. Because he, he don't make no mistakes. I wish that there were a lot more people in our local government who would come down here and take a look at some of this stuff and effectively say, we're gonna take this out. Because this is not a way to live. This is, that grandmother down there, if they have poisoned her dog already, if the dope dealers burn down the house two doors down, how long is it before the day will come to where they're gonna go after her and those grandchildren? It's hard to imagine Memphis as a beacon of hope, but after World War II, thousands of black families escaping the overwhelming poverty and racism of the Mississippi Delta established middle-class lives in Memphis. It was known as the city of churches, and even under the vile Jim Crow regime, 90% of black men held down jobs and supported families. Today, the old order has been turned upside down. 46% of black men are unemployed or out of the labor force. 77% of black children are born to single mothers. And more than 21,000 black men in Memphis have disappeared altogether through incarceration or early death. So many senseless murders. Yes. Too many young folk yes, in the grave. Oh, too early. And it's important for you to realize that time is not long. In South Memphis, I met hundreds of men and women who still believe in the old moral order, but it feels like a lost cause. The streets have been taken over by gangs, drugs, and incredible violence. So let me tell you something. Don't let them catch you with your work. And still, the faithful hold out hope. They're still grappling with what went wrong and how we can fix it. All these things that we talked about, our failures, 
the genesis of this starts with our environment, how we were raised. Everything that we see around us, the people that influence us, our parents, uh, our friends, our relatives, the, the, the social integration that's around us shape our values. And our values are the things that influence our behavior, our thinking, our thought process. All, all the brothers in here, they've been through something, man. And I, I ain't trying to make myself look no how. But man, man. <laughs> man, I, I, man, I, man, I might have been through so much and seen so much, man. And, and man, it, 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 it's really hit home for me, man. You know what I'm saying? I tell people all the time, man, that, that man, my mama raised three boys, man. Man, and both of my brothers were killed, man. And man, my brothers were my friends, man. And if you have an experience what I've experienced and losing, man, these two brothers the way I have, and how we grew up and how close we were, man, that's that's a pain, man, that that that, that that's really hard to bear, man. But 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 man, through the grace of God, man, man, I made it, man, and I'm still here, and I'm here for a reason. I grew up in a rough neighborhood in Memphis. I started selling crack at 15. I've been to federal prison twice. I've been to state prison once. And during that time, man, I just decided, man, that right now is the time. Right now is the time to change. So here I am. These are the streets, man, where I come up here, man. Um, I spent a lot of years over here, man. And, uh, in these apartments, man, and, and it was rough, man. It was rough. It was always something going on. On all the streets up and down these apartments, man, it's always something going on. It really makes you feel like, like you've been set up to fail. Growing up in an environment like this, I want to take you down here and, um, and show you, man, uh, show you the apartment, man, that my brother died in. Right here, this is one of the apartments that we lived in, man. This used to be the living room. This used to be the living room right here. This was my room. Man, I can remember one time, man, I was selling crack out of the window in this room. Man, I, I was trying to man, make dollars, you know, and too many people didn't know about it. Definitely my mom didn't know about it. But um, yeah, that's what I was doing. I was doing that, man. For a lot of people here in Memphis, man, it's an economic challenge because it's so hard to survive. Um, one thing about here in the city of Memphis, if you're poor, you're poor. Um, if you have it, then more than likely you have more than enough. It's really just a survival of the fittest, man. It's survival of the fittest. It's in these broken places where I can see how far these communities have fallen. Since the 1950s, cities like Memphis have lost more than half of their social capital. All of the old churches and civic associations that once shaped young men have broken apart. In the 38126 zip code of South Memphis, 93% of all family households are headed by a single mother. 78% of all families are on public assistance, and only 20% of all working age men are employed full time throughout the year. Out of nearly 6,000 total residents, there are only 10 nuclear families. Over the past 50 years, we've tried to solve these problems through public policy. The federal government currently spends more than $3 billion a year on anti-poverty programs in Memphis, but nothing works. 
In Shelby County Jail, I met hundreds of men who've been through an endless gauntlet of failed schools, failed prisons, and failed social programs. It's a tragedy for these men, but it's the women who carry the real burden. For every father in prison, there's a mother left to raise a family on her own. It's hard to see how they can create a better life for their kids. You got any homework? I already did it. I already did it. That's a good thing. Sometimes I like to say they my oil and water. <laughs> Night and day. Um, and drill is very into all sports. Anything dealing with the ball is Andrea's cup of tea. And um, Valisa, she's more like me, a little passive, a little passive and aggressive. And I just try to keep us very close. My girls extremely. We, we sure did talk a lot, right? Yes, ma'am. About being close. And if one don't have, yeah, correct, they got to share, you know. If it's not going to take your life away, you, you share it with your sister. Always. Hey, lady, how you doing? I'm all right, and you? I'm fine. Are you set a place today? Yes, ma'am, I am. Oh, what do you have? I have wings and salads and banana pudding. Okay, I want chef salad and some banana pudding. So how much is this gonna be? As a single mom, it's hard because I wish I can be everything, every place, and do it all by myself, which is just impossible, you know. What needs? Mm, cookies. <laughs> <laughs> And your dad, he's incarcerated. He's in Texas. And Valisa's father, he's in another state in Kentucky. Only thing he's given her lately is just broken promises. <laughs> I just want to save the day for my babies any way I can. Dear Dad, I really miss you. I wish that you was here. Hopefully you would get out soon, come on to see me passing good, good, good grades. I really wish that you would do better so you will not have to go back. After all, I hope you come back. My dad is in jail in Texas right now, and he's been there for about two years. When he away, I just feel sad, angry, horrible. Like somebody that you really love goes away. I you know mean, it's like something. It's like a piece of your. It's like a piece of your heart missing. All I just gotta do is just overcome it and don't think about it and just one day here come. <laughs> this is 201 Poplar, the county jail. Both of y'all fathers was here, you know. Dad did a little time here, and I remember Andrea telling me that she visited here, remember? And I grew up with my father being locked up my whole life. So, I just want to break that cycle. First, I want you to finish school, finish high school. College is a must. Get married before having kids. I wish the best for y'all.
There's no way of getting around the fact that in order to truly understand American poverty, we have to address the question of family. The challenge in places like Memphis is that the family has been broken all the way down. Fathers, husbands, brothers, and sons have all been displaced from their traditional roles. Look here. Look who was there. Me? No, it ain't look like you. That's your dad. Joseph has four kids scattered across Memphis and the Mississippi Delta. His youngest son barely knows him, and his oldest son is currently incarcerated for attempted second-degree murder. Joseph was placed in a $15 an hour job in a warehouse, but it's just the first step in putting together a meaningful life. Katrina is making ends meet on public assistance and selling plates of food from her doorstep, but it's an impossible calling. Andrea's father is serving time in prison, and Valisa's father promises to send money, but it never comes. He started new families and abandoned them too. A mess. But the most profound danger in places like Memphis is that the atomized individual, deprived of family and community, is too fragile to survive alone. As you heard in my Wednesday story about why some Memphians are leaving the city in frustration. The bureaucracy can ensure people's basic material needs, but it will never be enough. One mistake, one bullet, one illness can send it all off the rails. In November, I was diagnosed with MS. Look this way. I see your eyes moving. Just follow my finger here. Can you look up? But I always try to go positive with it. You know, what don't kill you only makes you stronger. Right now, that's my fight to stay strong for my girls. Mm, man, I still get real teary-eyed about it. I'm faced with something that's devastating to me, my role, being a single mom. And the only way I'm able to take my injection, she has to sing. That relaxes me a little bit. Can I lay by your side? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Next to you, you, and make sure you're. I just want to break that cycle. No education, no good job, depending on the system. I don't want my kids to adapt to that. I don't want them to accept that. I just want better, that's it, a better life.
This week, the city of Stockton in California's Central Valley has been all over the news. The city of Stockton, California. Stockton, California. Stockton, California. This is country's biggest city to go bankrupt. It's official Stockton, Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Yeah, you know, he's been saved by Hazel Clinton's balance bonds. This is currently in the homeless encampment area. Stockton is a, a tale of two cities, a tale of the haves and the have-nots. All you have to do is take a drive, pretty much any direction, any freeway undercrossing, and you'll find what we like to call a tent city where you have dozens, sometimes hundreds of people sleeping in tents. 35. And I haven't seen really a great effort in the last 30 years to try to bridge that gap. Now this particular area right here, we have the um, Amtrak train station and uh, downtown Stockton just right off of there, that area just to our north. And so this particular area right here is kind of the forgotten part of town. There was a lot of businesses at one time, but as you can see, it's pretty much a wasteland. Um, there's been businesses that was once standing here either burnt down or was destroyed. And so you probably have several hundred people down here at any given time. You guys speak English? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm, uh, come on out real quick. I'll just talk to you. Nobody's in trouble, so just kick back. What's your name? Mm, Juliana. Juliana. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had uh, problems with law enforcement no. in the past? No. No. Good girl? Yes. Yeah. Mm. When's the last time you used drugs? Mm, not even that long ago. What's not that long ago? Right there. Oh, right. Oh, is that where you get high at? Yeah. You do what do you usually use when you... Scissors. Scissors? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. What kind of drug is it? Like meth or what is that? Meth. It is? Yeah. What other drugs? Not Nothing else. Uh, have you ever been to I feel like there's a sickness. It's like a, a plague almost of despair. It's a lack of hope, a lack of faith, a lack of trust among the community. And through the years and through the decades, the value of, of one's life here in this town has been devalued greatly. And I've seen that. So right here is a spot where this murder took place. And you see the memorial. Uh, you see memorials like this on a lot of street corners here downtown. Uh, it's pretty sad right here. I actually, the, the very next street over is where I was born at. I had stayed in this neighborhood. That could have been me right there. In many ways, Stockton is a city of the future. 50 years ago, it was an all-American city that welcomed poor people from all over the world and gave them a path into the middle class. But that great California dream has now disappeared. Today, Stockton is a post-industrial city. Many of the agricultural and light manufacturing jobs have been mechanized and chased away. It's a post-racial city, a quarter white, a quarter black, a quarter Latino, and a quarter Asian. And it's a post-familial city. In some Section 8 housing complexes, 100% of all children are born to single mothers. Over the past 30 years, the Stockton City Council has spent billions of dollars on urban redevelopment projects and unsustainable public pensions. The mayor sent in to clean up the mess is currently under indictment for embezzlement, profiteering, and public corruption. But the local newspaper headline pretty much says it all. It's a bankrupt city not only financially, but on a deeper human level. In the 95204 zip code of central Stockton, I met countless young men who survive on a combination of the drug trade, violence, and the generosity of girlfriends. My hustles, I started kicking in doors and taking what I needed. Open up the door, hurry up. Who's in your house? Lay, tell them to lay down on the ground. Get naked. Give me all your phones, run everything, everything. I need everything. It's a merciless world of all against all. I've been stabbed. I've been shot at. In neighborhoods like this, it feels like the man who goes to work and takes care of his family 
is a relic of the past. I've seen everything. I've seen people get beat up. I've seen people fighting in the middle of the street. There's been multiple shootings, prostitution, a lot of crackheads, a lot of dope fiends. I had some enemies banging on my door three o'clock in the morning telling me to come out the house. Then I don't know what the hell to do. Tomorrow I'll work with Modesto. Yeah. Okay. Good. Try it. Oh, that's good. Num num nums, huh? One more. Want another bite? Try again. Um, uh oh. The guy came knocking on the door this morning. He stuffed a note in the door. What kind of note? It just says that we owe them money. Oh. Does that say move out? No. Oh. Well, well that's a plus then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just says that we're behind. A couple years ago, I got in trouble. I had gotten to a, a high-speed chase, and I got caught with some guns that I should not have had, and I made a horrible mistake. And uh, when I was arrested, my daughter was uh, not even a month old yet. No, no. So she was a newborn. So I missed my daughter's first birthday, which was one of the things that really, uh, it just killed me inside. Say, hi, mommy. <laughs> say, hi, Ashley. <laughs> say, say, hi, daddy. <laughs> say, hello. It's been a while, maybe a year or longer since Michael's been out. Yeah, I think it's hard because you see all these people that they don't have jobs. They're just doing drugs and selling drugs and that's about it. So it's hard for both of us to make it, but we're trying, you know. In cities like Stockton, we've been fighting an invisible war for nearly three generations. We now spend $1.1 trillion a year on anti-poverty programs, but the official poverty rate hasn't changed in half a century. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. The problem is that both political parties have treated human beings as functions in a math problem. We cannot simply ignore the failures of welfare or expect them to go away. If we can just change some of the variables, cut spending here, increase spending there, we can fix this. But the truth is that human beings can't be reduced to the mathematical sense. We're complex individual creatures who live in a vast web of family, culture, economics, and community. No matter how careful it's designed, the bureaucracy can never satisfy our deeper human needs. Ultimately, the people I met in America's forgotten cities are searching for a sense of meaning, purpose, and moral order. They're desperately looking for something higher. In the book of James, James reminds us of the reality that even in Christian life, there are trials and temptations that we must all face in our walk with God. If you grew up in Stockton, you grew up in a bad neighborhood. 
Some of us were incarcerated. Some of us were in prison. Some of us were hooked on drugs. Some of you did ugly things with your body, amen. And we can all blame the, the neighborhood. We can all blame the gang. We can blame our family, amen. But I'm here to tell you, there's no one to blame, amen, somebody. If you want to get out of your situation, God can lift you up. David said he brought me out of a horrible pit, a miry clay. He put my feet upon a solid rock. There ain't no pit you cannot get out of. And whether you call on the name of Jesus, he'll pull you out the pit, he'll pull you out the mud, he'll pull you out of any situation you might find. My God will save you, my God will deliver you one time, two times, three times, a hundred times. If he has to, there ain't no pit that God can't pull you from. There ain't no trial that God can't take you through and bring you out looking good for Jesus. Oh, Pastor, you ain't never went through nothing. I've been through all kinds of things. Gosh, you ain't seen what I see. I've probably seen worse, my friend. We got to let go of some of those old know, ways and those yeah, old habits, you know what I mean? I know, I was there, bro. I ran away from, from home when I was 15 years old. At 15 years old, I took off. I was I was gone, man. I was living on the streets. I was gang banging. I was getting high, shooting dope. Mm -hmm. You know, doing my thing, man. Running running while carrying a gun. You know, uh, I was messed up. I was hurting, man. I was tore up, man. I didn't. I, but I didn't. I didn't know way. any other way. I didn't know any other yeah. way until somebody just like this actually handed me a flyer from Victor. I said, you know, man, God can change your life. And at that moment, I was at a point where I was I was tired. I was tired of I was tired of the way I was living. I was tired of the lifestyle that I was you know I was in. I said, man, what do I have to do? What do I have to do, man? And I was ready. I was ready to make a change. We got a Christian recovery home for men. It's an intense program. It'll help you get your life together. You know what I mean? Everybody has a story. It could be through drugs. It could be through abuse. It could be through violence. And our families are broken down. Our communities are broken down. People's lives are broken down. They're devastated. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God. Uh... God, that you would just That's why we're here. That's why this ministry is here. We want to let people know that they're not in a hopeless situation, that as long as they're breathing, there's hope. All right, my brother. God bless you. All right, man. God bless you, man. God bless you, bro. All right. All right, man. We're going to say a prayer right now over this neighborhood so that God's peace would come upon us and God's peace would be in you and that God's love would penetrate your life. Every head bow. Bring peace to this neighborhood. Bring salvation to this neighborhood. Bring deliverance to this neighborhood. God, move in a powerful way in this neighborhood. The people that come into our church, they come in hurting. They come in empty. They come in broken. They come in in need of a miracle, in need of a healing, in need of a touch, in need of, of somebody loving them. You see? And that's the beginning of the process. You can be that mother, so you can break the chains for your child. Then all the questions you have for your family, you don't know your parents. God can... If we can affect a person, we can affect the community, we can affect the city, we can affect the world. Walking with the pastors and the healers through the streets of Stockton, I discovered a city with its soul laid bare. I didn't set out to tell a story of religion, but the reality is that faith-based organizations are still the cornerstone of poor communities. In places like Stockton, inner city churches are often the only remaining institutions that offer a clear sense of meaning, purpose, and community. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy this morning, God. In the Men's Recovery Home at Victory Outreach, they have an astonishing 70% success rate helping addicts and gang members turn their lives around. Their secret is that they speak to the heart of the human condition and transform people through genuine human relationships. They're deeply connected to these communities and can demonstrate that hope is possible through their own life experience. The real challenge for men in our forgotten cities is to help them deal with their pain, childhood abuse, violence, and family disintegration, and restore a sense of internal order in their lives. It's deep human-to-human -human work 
but it's the only way to help our most vulnerable citizens meet the demands of the world. So the last time that you lived here, what's been going on to the last time we talked? You know, I've been trying to apply for places. I've been job hunting. I know my wife has been really, really trying her hardest. You know, she's been giving it her all. But it just seems like there's like no opportunity. And it breaks my heart inside to know that sometimes I can't provide for my family. I can't do things that I want to do. And sometimes you just get that low morale, you know, because yeah. of everything that's going on. The city, the bankruptcy, the struggles, the gangs, the violence, all that stuff. It's like it's all culminating. It's all coming together. It's almost like we're in this pressure cooker. And I think the times when I've been arrested, the times that I went away, those were the times when that pressure cooker, it just blew. You know, it was bound to happen and it ended up happening. And now I'm just kind of left trying to pick up the pieces and trying to continue. My challenge to you, Michael, is this. Every morning when we get up, we have to have a sense of purpose of why we're getting up this day and what are we gonna do this day. You have the responsibility with your kids right now and taking care of them and providing for them and being there for Marlene. That in itself is a responsibility that most men in this population that we come from, Michael, cannot maintain. And when they try to maintain it, it gets too stressful for them, overwhelming, they give up. But you're not gonna give up. I say we name it Michael, like me, but the middle name could be something else. Something Mexican. Yeah. So that way, if he comes out looking hella Mexican, then we name him that, you know? Well, his middle name will fit. So I'm 31 weeks pregnant. So nine more weeks to go. And Mia's gonna have a little brother. And a baby brother. Yeah, baby brother. Hopefully, this baby will make Michael push a little bit more, trying to find a job and wanting to do better for our kids. If you'll be working in an area with equipment and machinery, don't wear rings and jewelry that can get caught in the moving parts. Keep long hair tied back or under a hat, again, to avoid getting caught in machines. Personal protective equipment. What is P Michael? Yes. Hi, Michael. I'm Jacqueline. Hi. Hi. I know you just met with Patty briefly right now, and she got some information from you in regards to some of your work history, and she did let me know that you worked for Kmart. Uh, back in 2011, you did a little bit of stalking, um, loss prevention, reorganizing. So right now, you're basically just are looking to get your foot in the door somewhere. Yeah and get working. So I, I do have to be honest, we do do background for everybody that comes into our office. It's an automatic for us. But because you were upfront with me, we actually have a client that we may be able to hop out with. So what we'll do is we're gonna go ahead and reach out to them. They are pretty busy right now. I'm sure they'll have some need. And we'll try to set up an interview okay. for you with them. Once you meet with them, seems like it's something you'd be interested in, it works out then you'll know ahead of time and you can get those steel-toed boots. Okay, will that work? Yeah. Okay, awesome. We'll do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's so hard to let go of living that life out there in the streets, being on welfare, being on food stamps, living that kind of life, and really struggling. But I think that it's something instinctively inside myself, inside of all men, that you want to work, you want to provide. And I want there to be a time when my children can look to me and they can say, that's my dad, and I'm proud.
As I've gotten to know men like Michael, I've started to understand why our approach to poverty has failed over the past 50 years. We've tried to solve our problems through top-down public policies, but I've learned that real change doesn't happen from the top down, it happens from the inside out. It starts within each individual human heart, then slowly works its way outward to families, neighbors, and communities. The solution for our forgotten cities is not just to revive their economies, but to create a new foundation for our fractured postmodern world. We must rediscover the traditional sources of meaning, faith, family, work, and community, and adapt them to the modern condition. As a society, we must ensure that being poor doesn't mean being disconnected from the primary sources of human happiness, that even those at the bottom can lead dignified and meaningful lives. Although we may have lost the old structures, Within each individual is the capacity to create new webs of meaning and connection. Even in the bleakest situations, human beings have agency. We all have the capacity to make life a little better. Yeah, we're on El Dorado Street right now. We're on our way. This is Central Stockton. We're on our way. We're going to the hospital, St. Joseph's. So we should be there within the next couple minutes. So Marlene is having some uh, pains, contractions and stuff. So we automatically know that, yeah, it's gonna be soon, so. family, I wouldn't be alive right now. The only thing that keeps my heart beating, the only thing that keeps my old heart from giving up on me is knowing that I have a reason why. I have a reason to keep breathing in and out and moving forward. They give me a purpose. The thing that I've been looking for my whole life is to be here for them. That's what's changed me. It's changed my life, it's changed my perspective, and it changed uh, my heart. It's a miracle. <laughs> Here, just put them like. Sir, I would prefer you sit on a stationary chair. Just stand up, put his head right there. You got him. I know everything's gonna go good for him because he has parents that love him. I think that's what life is all about. It's all about your family, your children. It's about all of us doing our best to live meaningful and happy lives. I just wanna make sure that he lives that kind of a life, you know? I don't want him to go through the pain that I had to go through and the suffering. I want him to live a happy life. I don't want him to ruin and make mistakes and fall back. I wanna help pick him up. And that way in the end, you know, he lives. He lives for us, for his family, you know? And we all live for each other because in this world, that's all we got. It's the bond between all of us that holds us together. 